Hello there. There is a prevailing view that being left wing means being green. We're all meant to be watermelons, green on the outside and red on the inside. This is a view that I totally reject and I have covered the issue to some extent in the recent video on economic growth. Staking a claim to be the biggest watermelons are people who call themselves ecological Marxists. They claim that if Marx were around today, he would be a greenie. In their view, he'd be like them and support organic agriculture and a steady state economy based on renewable resources that would provide everyone with so-called sufficiency. In such a world, the economies of the poor countries would increase a bit, while those of the rich countries would shrink quite a lot. The most notable exponent of this view is John Bellamy Foster, the editor of the Monthly Review. He goes through the writings of Marx and tortures them until they deliver what he wants. Foster draws our attention to a number of Marx's views that you could use to start building a case that he was a greenie. Marx was concerned about the destruction of natural stocks of fertile soil, forests and fish that were needed for future generations. He also commented on how consumption often included frivolities that reflected people's alienation rather than real needs, and that human thriving requires more than increased consumption. Foster also correctly pointed out that when Marx talked about mastering nature, he did not mean destroying it, but mastering its laws and harnessing it accordingly. However, from here on, the argument begins to get really weird. Foster tries to extract greenness from the fact that Marx was a materialist, who believed we lived in a material world where we depended on plants and animals, for food, water to drink and air to breathe. This is a rather silly argument, given that you would be hard pressed to find someone who disagrees with this view. Foster also misconstrues Marx's constant reference to the fact that capitalists are compelled by the forces of competition to accumulate capital in order to survive. He tries to make out that Marx actually disapproved of this phenomenon. In fact, Marx's view was that this is what made capitalism superior to previous class societies, where the ruling class wasted all the surplus value on conspicuous consumption. Instead of being compelled to accumulate, these societies were compelled to stagnate. By Reinvesting most of the surplus value, capitalism delivers economic and social progress. Foster also picks up on Marx's analysis of the contradiction between town and country. In the separation of town and country, Marx was concerned about two things. Firstly, it stunted the brains of those in the country and ruined the physical health of those in the city. Secondly, it meant a break in the nutrient cycle as human waste and food scraps were not returned to the farm, but instead dumped in rivers and the ocean. This transfer of people from the land to cities was an inevitable part of capitalist development. Capitalist farming needed less workers, and the cost to the soil and to workers of concentrating the latter in the cities was of no concern to industrial capitalists. However, these contradictions are being resolved without having to spread the population evenly over the landscape. High density living in large cities can now be quite healthy and comfortable. Living in the countryside no longer means being cut off from the world, given modern modes of transport and communications. This modern transport can also truck in fertilizer, be it human waste, animal manure, or the synthetic kind that is now produced in abundance. Indeed, the present concern is excessive nutrients and resulting emissions into groundwater or the atmosphere. The best hope for dealing with this under present conditions is through increased regulation and better management, including greater adoption of precision farming. The greening of Marx, of course, requires Foster to explain away how Marx and Engels talked about communism unleashing the productive forces. He claims this thoroughly ungreen viewpoint was confined to their youthful, less mature writings. This is simply not true. Marx in Critique of the Gotha Program of 1875 and Engels in anti During of 1877 both express pro-growth views. I have provided the relevant quotes in the comments section below. 
In the video on growth, I argue, firstly, that far greater levels of material output are needed for communism, because it has to be based on shared prosperity rather than shared poverty. And secondly, that there are no environmental or resource constraints that prevent us from achieving high and increasing levels of global prosperity. I've provided a link to that video below. See you next time.